This is Mike Zimmer with Tom Pelissero a couple of months back. First cut, Mike Zimmer, what have you been up to? Here we go. Well, you know, I've, uh, I've got about 270 acres in Kentucky, so that keeps me a little bit busy. But I built a little uh, office building that I go over there. I watch tape and study analytics and all the different things that you, you kind of do. So just stay on top of the game. Gosh, I hope he was uh, understanding what the overtime rules were going into the Super Bowl. I hope his analytics team was better than Kyle Shanahan's in San Francisco. Does it sound like he took the same page out of the McCarthy playbook? Like, go get on a farm somewhere, build you a little, some some little uh, sort of shed thing and yeah. a barnyard no, house. And he, I think he actually did the, the, the work. Well, and, and he didn't say there, I watched every single offensive snap. Yeah. We'll give him time. We have, another, yeah. we, have, we have another clip here, man. Maybe I hope to God he doesn't say that. Yeah, what football studying have you done, Mike? Well, you know, I get a lot of the game tapes. I, I go through a lot of the uh, uh, third and fourth down situations, a lot of the red zone, you know, all the little game game management things that you, you try to do. And then, you know, the other things you do, Tom, is you kind of look at, um, you know, what you've done good over the last eight years, what you could have done better, what, um, you know, things that, that you would have changed or, or, or done differently over the, over the course of the time. Yeah, you know, so this seems like a, a pretty standard evaluation self-scout that yeah. you would hope that, you know, anybody in his situation is going through. I, I think it's pretty in vogue. Um, and, you know, Mike McCarthy was part of popularizing it to, you know, do this kind of a national interview with somebody as you're trying to get a, a job and, and get your name out there. I don't think this interview is like super mind-blowing or compelling, you know, and maybe that's why we haven't heard about it until now. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I, I don't know what kind of conclusions he was coming to. I wouldn't expect to have him share all of that with us, but <laughs> I am encouraged to know that, you know, he's looking at analytics and he's trying to figure out what the trends are. And I think with his attention to detail, I would bet on him to have some answers for what the trends are when he when he shows up and starts coaching. That would that'd be my expectation right now. Yeah, I'd be the same way. I'd be the same way. And this was uh this was around Christmas time. Uh, during the season when he was he was still trying to perhaps get his name and some of the head coaching opportunities that were out there. But I do think it is encouraging. I mean, him saying he looking back at his entire tenure in Minnesota, what could he have done differently? Looking at red zone, looking at third down, you know, looking at the important stuff there. But he didn't go as far as to say, like Walchuk said, that he's watched every single thing <laughs> about every single team and he knows it all. Uh, but I, I do expect him, like his deep dive now, if you talk to him, he could probably tell you a ton about the Cowboys over the last year or two defensively for sure. Yeah, you know, this is a guy who has made a career out of the attention to the details. And I think no matter what era you are from, if you're a attention to detail guy, it is still football. And you're very used to adapting and taking in new trends and figuring out an answer to it. Uh, I think most importantly, though, from Zimmer, to me, the thing I'm excited about is uh, him convincing the Joneses that you can't just decide to skip trying to find great players at positions. Th these teams have great players everywhere, and you saw what happened to the 49ers defense when he took just one of them away. So be tireless in your pursuit of there's, talent. There's a story that comes that came out about, you know, you mentioned about not knowing the rules. And did you see the thing about Andy giving his credit to his analytics guys about about knowing the rules? And I and, for overtime, yeah. But see if he really did know the rules, because okay, he gives credit to a guy named Mike Frazier. He's their analytics chief, and he does all the work on it. Is what Reed said. He said the mindset knowing both teams will have a possession of the ball was critical to the decision regarding the coin flip. Reed also learned on the leaned on the officials for certain potential scenario decisions in the extra session he says quote we would have kicked the ball off the officials actually are on top of it right away there were still a couple of seconds on the clock and we had the extra official on the sideline asking me what we would do i said we'll kick it off patrick mahomes was on the field and he was the one who had to do it and then dave tube who is the coordinator the uh, special teams coordinator was that a mistake it was that is that did he do it the right way? He he kicked. He did kick. Yeah. So he all the, the whole time he was going to kick. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, because I mean they because Chris Jones and Pat Mahomes have come out since the game and said that they worked on this in the two weeks leading up to it and their strategy no, I, was yeah that they would okay. go for two knowing that they would get the second possession if they won the toss and would kick. 
you know, see, that's okay. That's because uh, I was sitting there thinking like that he maybe, okay, I had it. I maybe, had it he, maybe he messed up. I, he had messed up and the officials like corrected him, you know, so you sure you want to kick kind of a thing. But, okay. All right. Uh, next piece of coaching content here for you. Mike Zimmer uh, was the subject of a study from Dan Rogers uh, blogging the boys here, uh, Woolchuck. Yeah. I mean, uh, so Cowboy Stats and Graphic does a great job. They put out uh, a little graphic about, Mike Zimmer, specifically against the Shanahan coach tree, which and we talked about Dan Quinn, the, the one thing that he really had an issue with during his time with the Cowboys was against LaFleur. Uh, you know, McVay, they got the best of this year, certainly, but against the 49ers and Kyle Shanahan. But based on, you know, c- c- completion over expected, yards after catch, EPA per dropback, just a multitude of different ways that they evaluate defense, Zimmer has had more success since 2017 against the Shanahan tree than basically every defensive coordinator not named Bill Belichick. Badass. So he's done a fantastic job. But he does note that when you look at the history of Mike Zimmer when he takes over a place, the first year, there can be a learning curve. Hmm. And by the middle of the season, they're off in a playoff caliber defense. But by year two, that's when you start to see an elite level of defense under Mike Zimmer because there is a different way in teaching. Uh, His peak defense is in Minnesota. They had four straight seasons where they never fell out of the top quartile and underlying strength against the pass. So their pass defenses are always very good. And his background, I believe, is a defensive backs coach, right? So, I mean, that's an area that he's always succeeded in. His numbers in Cincinnati were even better. So reasonable expectations for Zim. The first, you know, say half of the season, there might be a little bit of, ooh, this isn't, you know, maybe it's a little shaky, but second half of the season, this thing should be kicking into gear and we should see really some of the drastic changes that he's made compared to what we were seeing defensively under Dan Quinn. Timelining expectations in another tweet, you know, playoff caliber by the end of the first regular season by mid-season two, arriving as the NFL's elite and this over the last two decades, significantly farther ahead of schedule than a Ron Rivera coach team. And I, I think it makes sense. I, I, you know, I'm kind of surprised it, it doesn't take longer for uh, defenses to get installed, finding the kind of players that, you know, really that you need. And then specifically for Zimmer, teaching all of the, uh, you know, the details that Greg Ellis talked about. Yeah. I mean, this is what all the players talk about. I, I think it is different. It's like, okay, there's there's being coached by a football guy who's asking me to play defense and I do these things, but there's some coaches who are so precise in what they're looking for and how it all combines to benefit one another that, you know, half a season, a, a, a full season, that's, that's great information. Maybe we uh, just need to be patient with this a little bit. Yeah, I, I liked what uh, Cowboy Stats also noted about the, the Quinn's, you know, Quinn's pass defense being very dependent on turnover production, uh, which obviously is an unreliable source of value because we talk about, especially like in a one-game sample, we know the turnovers, it's it's not a guarantee year to year. Oftentimes, if you led the league in turnovers uh, forced, it's not necessarily that it's just going to duplicate itself. That can be kind of all over the place, high volatility there. So Quinn's defense has got to a point where, yes, it is it is an ode to him over the course of his time here. They were one of the best, obviously, or the best at forcing turnovers. But in games where you don't do that, can your defense just be fundamentally sound and win football games? Or do you have to get the turnovers? Um, and he says that Zimmer's success is grounded in top-notch fundamentals, especially limiting the kind of damaging yards after catch that Quinn's group routinely gave up. Nice. That is huge, man. Yeah, I mean, that goes with the, the debate of, like, you know, what's more important, the turnovers or, you know, the explosive plays that we talked about during the season. I think both, obviously. But, you know, you're, if you're getting the turnovers, maybe it doesn't matter as much if you're also giving up a couple of massive explosive plays for touchdowns in the back end you, as well. You know, I, I think their secondary balances it well. I, I think it's more their linemen and their linebackers who find themselves out of position. Yeah. And, you know, that's where the problem happens. So, you know, I, I think you can get the best of both worlds in that department. Department. Then I wanted to ask you guys, this is sort of picking up on a conversation we were having a, a little bit earlier, like under what circumstances would you draft a, a tackle in, in round one? Um, very interesting article here, and we go back to blogging the boys actually pointing out how the Cowboys have been so successful over the years drafting offensive players, and they really get into trouble when they're drafting defensive players. This is the first round. Mm. You know, I, 
I, I feel like if you draft an offensive lineman, it's going to be a really good player, maybe a perennial pro bowler, an all pro dude. Like that is their history in the in the first round if if they're locked into one. And on on defense, it's a crapshoot. I would feel weird if I'm evaluating my scouting department, my front office. Like, do we have a blind spot here? But I would start considering it at this point. Like, guys, don't be sure if you think we got the right corner that we need to be taking or the right linebacker that we need to be taking. Is, especially if there's an offensive lineman on the board, we can trust our evaluation of them much more. you know. And maybe you extend that to wide receiver. I don't know how many positions are in this group, but it certainly seems like whoever has been advising them on which offensive lineman to take is really good at his job, much better than the guys who were advocating for other positions there in the first round. Yeah, and that's why I think you have to lean into your strengths in the draft and understand that let's let's approach free agency with the understanding of what we we miss on when it comes to the draft. Let's go buy a couple of pieces that we don't feel good about uh, in terms of drafting high because our hit rate's a little bit low here. So we'll supplement that with free agency. We might not be able to just go bargain shopping the way we've done for the last decade. Maybe we got to up the ante a little bit. Uh, but it's worth it so that we go to the draft and we know, hey, the, the positions that we now need to secure are things that we nail. And offensive line is certainly right there. That's, yeah. And that's good team building, right? We are going to fill our holes to where we go into the draft and we can take best available player, which is why at 24, no matter if Tyron Smith is on this roster or not, and an offensive tackle is there that you like, I am team take that offensive tackle. If he's the best player. Yeah, because eventually he's going to end up having to play for you this year as well because Tyron's not staying healthy. But then also now you have your starter. And, and you he don't might, have to worry about Tyler. He could easily be better than Steele. If, be well. if you're taking a tackle in the first round. 100%. Uh, if he if he can play both spots as well, I thought you were telling us about a guy who has played all three positions: center, tackle. Is he going to be gone? Uh, That's a guy from Duke. Yeah, Graham Barton, and and so he could be there. He, but the Brian got me a little scared because I think he might have some uh, some medical issues. Yeah. Oh, so he's a guy that you're going to have to make sure is cleared and you're comfortable with the medical grade there.